Okay, good morning. Uh, as uh, the, the Chief said, we're here to announce uh, the charges on Mr. Harold Kerr. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say um, a couple things. Obviously, uh, this individual is presumed innocent at this point in time and will remain until he's convicted. Uh, the other caution that I want to say now before, um, before I forget, in case I forget, is I, you're going to hear, obviously, this, this unfortunately was worse than just simply a kidnapping. And uh, there are terrible facts and circumstances uh, involving a five-year-old, which you'll now hear about. And um, the family uh, of the victim is requesting privacy and asking uh, that, uh, that the press uh, respect that, and, and, and I'm sure you understand that. I appreciate your cooperation uh, in that. Um, Mr. Herr has been arrested in the abduction of our five-year-old victim uh, and charged with a number of, of felony counts. I'll go through them one at a time. Uh, there's two counts of kidnapping uh, charged against him, both felonies in the first degree, one count of unlawful restraint, a felony in the second degree, uh, one count of interference with the, with the custody of children, a felony of the second degree. He's charged with involuntary deviant sexual intercourse of a child, a felony in the first degree, which carries uh, a 10 year mandatory sentence. Sexual assault, a felony in the second degree. Uh, two counts of aggravated indecent assault, uh, one of which carries a five year mandatory and one of which carries a 10 year mandatory. Um, one count of misdemeanor one indecent assault. One count of unlawful contact with a minor, um, and finally corruption of minors, a felony in the third degree. Uh, so he's looking at two 10-year mandatory as well as a five-year. Uh, I didn't add him up, but obviously it's, he's looking at over 100 years of potential uh, when he's convicted of these crimes. Uh, as I said, he remains uh, presumed innocent. This case, you know, the facts are well known to the media and the public concerning uh, the abduction uh, part of it. Uh, and, and the circumstances thereof on, that started on uh, July 11th in the afternoon when uh, she was playing at her grandmother's and went around the, the side of the building to um, look for a bicycle, get her bicycle. Uh, Mr. Herr was, was there uh, waiting for her. He, um, she said hi to him, he said hi to her, and, and it immediately his, his crime started. Uh, he told her, you're pretty and I think I'm gonna keep you. Uh, at which point in time he grabbed her by the neck and forced her into her car, into his car. He then took her away and told her that she had to be naked right now or he would kill her. He told her if she did not listen, he would kill her. He then had her, you know, she removed her clothes. Uh, she's facing death, this five-year-old. And um, then he sexually, uh, he took her someplace in an unknown location at this point in time and sexually molested her in, uh, in numerous ways uh, with his mouth and uh, penetration with his finger, uh, causing her obviously pain. Um, he uh, then took her at some point in time, uh, mentioned that he would take her uh, for ice cream. He actually did go uh, to Pinewood, Pinewood, right? Pine 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 sorry, uh, dairy. Uh, there and uh, she was naked so did not go in. He would have approached um, by himself and got some of the ice cream uh, for whatever reason this is what he did um, and after about a couple hours uh, did drive back in the direction of where she was from and that's when uh, you know the community had kicked in along with the, the police um, and the teenagers that you're aware of already, I'm not going to refer to them by, by name, even though I know they've discussed, they've disclosed their names um, to the media. That's their choice. They're, they're uh, juveniles, and it's our policy not to do that. Um, that doesn't diminish, uh, particularly the, the, their contributions um, to, to assisting in the arrest and saving um, our, fi our young five-year-old victim. Um, these are the kind of crimes that do uh, enrage the community, uh, defend their sensibilities, and get the kind of outpouring of community assistance to police officers that we had and we're fortunate to have in this case. Um, he, he dropped her off, uh, he sent, saw the police, probably took a different route to avoid uh, getting caught, and fortunately for, for all of us, um, these teenagers followed him and were able to get a description of the car uh, which I'll let the chief talk about more when he makes his comments about putting this this case together, but that provided tremendous assistance um, in locating this individual and determining who, in fact, 
was responsible uh, for these horrific crimes. Uh, you, you, I certainly want to thank the community. I certainly want to thank uh, the police department, Manhattan Township, uh, for the outstanding work they've done. They've really worked uh, constantly on this, and Chief Harkins for his leadership, and uh, Karen Mansfield, who worked hand in hand with the police uh, on this case, as she does on many of our, our worst uh, sexual offenses. This, um, this is a nightmare case for, for parents and for everyone in the community. Uh, just to think about the, the horrific nature of having a loved one, a five-year-old daughter, um, abducted even for a short period of time, uh, sends chills up and down all of our spines. Um, it's haunting, uh, it's terrible, and there really is no punishment uh, that we can provide that's gonna be adequate uh, to make up for, for what was done just for the abduction, not even getting to the fact that he sexually molested a five-year-old. Uh, in, our, in our lives, you like to be able to tell your, your children that, um, that monsters are not real, but they are. And um, for an individual in a case like this to approach a stranger, a child of another, um, forcibly abduct her, Threaten to kill a five-year-old, that in and of itself is hard to fathom, that someone would threaten to kill a five-year-old girl. And, uh, and then, not only that, to not stop there, but then to proceed to sexually molest her in multiple ways, um, that is a monster. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that he, is, uh, he, he faces justice and will never be released. I'm not, as I said, I'm not sure that's enough, um, but we work within the constraints of the law, and um, that's what we'll do. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody here uh, from the police department, from, from my office, and particularly from the community, uh, because without them, I'm not sure that this gets solved. Uh, fortunately, it is, and we still have a job to do. We have a lot more uh, um, things to follow up on, and I would say, there are probably individuals out there um, that's, that could provide some information and, and I'll ask them you know, to come forward, uh, even if they think they, it might not be relevant, um, just anything about this case. You know, people saw him uh, driving around and although we have a, a, a case here, um, it, we still have to prove him guilty in, in the court. So um, I'll let the chief talk about some of the specifics of, of the investigation and then I'll take any and all questions. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Timmon. Uh, first, let me say that we'll make a copy of the affidavit available to you. They're in the back of the room. We'll make them before you leave. Um, I can simply say, as, as Mr. Stemmett said, that the community is very aware of what occurred already. Um, our, our focus uh, Friday morning really was on the Megan's Law list, and uh, this individual uh, came and jumped out at us basically as a, uh, as a potential suspect. Um, we began a surveillance on his home on Friday. Friday afternoon uh, after further investigation and determining that he was in violation of the Megan's Law registry <coughs> process, uh, he was taken into custody and, and of course uh, placed into prison on bail. Uh, from there, our investigation has uh, basically uh, revealed what Mr. Stemmett has already talked about, resulting in 11 charges. So I guess if, um, if you have any questions, we'll take them now if we can help. I'll just add a couple things. Uh, you, when you get the affidavit, uh, one of the teenagers identified uh, Mr. Harp, as well as his vehicle. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, five-year-old victim um, saw the Sunday paper, uh, Lancaster newspaper, which had the pictures of uh, the teenager that, that rescued her, as well as Mr. Her, and she, in it, she saw uh, the teenager and said, that's the boy that saved me, and um, then also saw the picture of her and said, that's the man. Uh, obviously, this took we were not as concerned about making an, an immediate arrest because he was in custody so quickly on the Megan's Law violation uh, on $200,000 bail, and we were monitoring that to make sure that he um, didn't post that. He's being held on no bail for this case due to the fact of the serious nature of the crime and that he is a threat to the community. Um, he has done a very similar crime to this, which is described in the affidavit and has also been covered by the media at this point in time, and, and that is obviously relevant to this case. Um, it's that in essence, he served all of his 20-year uh, sentence from when he did this 20-plus uh, years ago, uh, a very similar offense, 
um, and a similar, some very similar effects. Um, in essence, he served all of his time and maxed out and then was released. And um, there was a very short period of time in the middle of that sentence when he was released, I believe it was only for a few months uh, for when he was put back in. And then he's been out for a, a short period of time before this offense. So she identified him. Um, she also identified the cane that he used, uh, the car, based on her description. And as I said, the other teenager has identified the car as well. And there's some additional evidence. We haven't put everything in there, but that would be you know, the, the basis of it, uh, both the, the past record as well as um, some, of the, some of the other circumstances uh, that we have. And, and then you'll, it's a long affidavit. And I don't intend to read it. You guys will be able to read that for yourselves. But that's the highlights of it. So um, any questions? Can you talk about how the girl is doing? Well, that's one of the things that, that made this case take a little bit longer as far as making the arrest uh, was that you know, you're talking to a five-year-old about the worst thing that has happened to her and hopefully ever happens to, to her. The, um, and, and her attention span is less than that of an adult. So we couldn't just sit down and say in one interview, tell us what happened, tell us everything what happened, and here, sign this, write this down for us. Uh, the interviews had, had to be done in short stages. We did a number of interviews over a number of days, uh, the last one being yesterday morning, and that's why um, we just were typing up all these charges uh, yesterday, and that's why we had to push the, the conference back from the afternoon. I mean, this is, uh, you know, going to be something that unfortunately, you know, I'm not going to talk about her particular situation and her status. That's for the, that's a, I say a personal and family matter. I can tell you from other cases, um, these type of abuse cases, they scar these individuals uh, for, for their lives. And um, we hope that doesn't take place in this. Um, we have professionals uh, that, that, are, that are best able to deal with this. We offer those services to families and victims in cases like this. Um, but that's why this is so horrific. And, and you know, the abduction itself, just having a stranger threaten to kill you as a five-year-old, I mean, you can, you can envision that terror and that trauma, but then obviously I gave you the terrible facts beyond that. So uh, we'll hope for the best, but we've seen in the past that this has been absolutely devastating to, to individuals and affects their ability um, to have relationships and, and so forth. But again, that's just, I'm talking about other cases and hopefully it won't be for her. He admit to this? Uh, it's in what he said is in the affidavit. Um, I'm not. I can't comment on his statements. Other than that, um, the short answer would be no. How soon? Um, how early was he developed as a suspect? Well, very early on, um, a number of individuals. Uh, an officer, I believe, it was um, Randy Zook from uh, Lancaster City Police Department, uh, as well as uh, ADA Mansfield. Um, pretty quickly looked at, I know she looked at the Megan's Law registration, looking in the area, looking to see what anyone that found that description. I know I believe Randy Zook called in here to the police department and had some familiarity with this individual. And, and I believe that would have been the, the, in, you know, the initial call in. So it was pretty quickly on, um, so shortly after we had the description of the, of the individual from the teenager. And at that point, had he already been arrested for that Megan's Law violation or? He had not been. And then at that point then, now, then we went and looked at it and saw that he had not um, verified his address, and that's that led to the arrest. Um, do you know how long he had been in violation? It was a very, I was a, meant from May 8th on. So he has to he has to verify quarterly, and he had not done that from May 8th. He was registered at that address, but his his crimes are of the nature that he has to verify every uh, four months, three months. When it comes to criminals being, um, or the offenders being non-compliant, um, you guys had a reason to look into him in this case. But, but how long, you know, does it typically take if somebody's not registering to get them behind bars? Well, it really varies. I mean, the, the way it works is uh, the state police are to provide notification to the local police department that this person hasn't verified. Um, this is, you know, relatively new procedure. Uh, they have, they're dealing with massive amounts of number, thousands of individuals. Uh, you would have, honestly have to ask the state police for how long it typically takes. I think it varies. And, and then obviously it's gonna vary by police department as to how quickly they're gonna respond to that based on what's going on with their department, based on how many, their resources 
um, based on their evaluation of it. So I'm not sure I could give you a definite answer. Obviously, ideally, it would take place immediately and the police department would, would, would deal with it immediately. Um, but then I think, you know, that's, a, that's, that's gonna depend from department to department. You know, no one, there's no, obviously no one did anything in, intentionally wrong here. He was registered at, at that address. Um, and this guy had done it before and he was doing it again. I mean, there's one person responsible for this and he's in jail with no bail and, and his name's Harold Hart. How long had he been out of prison? Uh, two, a couple years. Three years. Hey, you mentioned uh, the police were going to kind of talk about how the teenager's description was so instrumental in this case. Yeah, I'll let the chief talk about that. Yep. Well, as we've all heard, the two boys were, and it's important, I think, for everybody to understand, the the community really, really came out to help in the search for this young girl. And in this case, it was two boys on a bike who made the effort to go through the community looking for the girl. Uh, they saw a car. They saw what they thought was the girl in the car, and they began to follow the car. Um, the car eventually stopped and let the girl out. And of course, one of the teenage boys approached the girl, got her, and then turned her over to the fire department. Now, his description was very instrumental in, in, in our investigation. He gave us a very good description on the car, the color, uh, and, and even the individual driving the car. So it was very helpful. Do you think you would have been able to solve it without that description? Well, I don't know that. I know that it was helpful to us, that, that he did the right thing, and it was extremely helpful, and it certainly made it easier for us. Once the description was put out there, did you guys receive a lot of calls, or how was the community in that aspect? I, I don't think, I think we had maybe one call after the description went out, the initial news uh, news release. Um, that was uh, towards another individual and not him. Can somebody put into context how common stranger abductions are? Are they fairly unusual? Or? Yeah, uh, very unusual. Um, I, I don't recall. I don't recall one in, in my entire career. Most cases like this are usually. We were talking about this earlier. It's it's some somebody that knows the uh, the child. How about you, Craig? Do you remember? I would I would say it's a, uh, a similar answer to the chief. Just just doesn't happen very much, and we're fortunate for that. But I mean that's why this is this is such a terrible case. Um, because we just, you just, I mean, it's unimaginable. And, and the parents are doing nothing wrong, and, and uh, the family was doing nothing wrong. She was gone for a very short period of time, and we'd like to believe we live in a world that you can go around the corner of your house, you're not gonna be abducted by Harold Hart, and have your daughter, you know, daughter sexually molested. So, but, uh, but they're out there. And, and, you know, we do say just, even though we've arrested this individual, there are other ones out there, and we are encouraged and urge parents to, uh, be vigilant, and and that's that's difficult to do. Uh, to multiple kids, you got you're distracted, and um, but incidents like this are, are reminders of how things can change in, in a moment. And we're just extremely fortunate that uh, that it didn't that it didn't turn out worse, and that, and that she's alive. Do you think he had been staking out that place if this was just a fluke, he happened to be driving by, saw her, grabbed her? I don't know, that would be speculation on my part. I don't think there's any question that, these, that his crime was premeditated. Uh, he, he wasn't out there to talk to anybody about philosophy. He was there looking for uh, a little girl, and he found one. And, um, and if, it wasn't, if it wasn't then, it, you know, it would have been somebody else. I mean, it, you know, that, that neighborhood is not necessarily the easiest to, to get into, and, and um, unless you know what you're doing, but it, it would be speculation on my part as to whether he knew there were a number of children in that neighborhood or not. I really don't know. He was looking for a little girl and he took one. Anything else? He's been out for three years. Are you, do you have any other open cases that he may have done this between the time he got out and this case? Uh, I, yeah, I can't comment on anything like that. Um, uh, I, I just can't make a comment about that. There's no pending other pending charges against him. Anything else for anybody? Do you know where that other five-year-old from 20 years ago is today? I do not, um, and and I hope, uh, I hope she's doing well. And, and um, obviously, we might have to reach out to, to that, reach back to that case because I believe the facts are so similar that you know it'll be our intent that that will be part of our presentation to the jury because it's pretty much that, very mostly identical. So um, hopefully, we don't have to go that far, but uh, you know we. Again, this is still unfolding, and that's something we can do looking forward, and will do. 
You mentioned over and over again that you have to work within the constraints of the law, that you don't think that this punishment is really enough. Is this a case where you wish you had the death penalty or something, but it just doesn't allow it for these charges? Or what would you put Well, I'm not talking about this particular case. Obviously, the law is what the law is. I'm just saying, you know, that, that these type of cases, people that abduct strangers and sexually molest them, uh, and we see a lot of sexual predators, uh, and a lot of them do it again. And then maybe it's time for a discussion on looking at the penalties for abducting a stranger and, and sexually molesting them, uh, and and, uh, and increasing those because this in this case he he served his maximum sentence and he still comes out and, and does it again at 73, and and uh, there are twisted people and he's one of them and um, you know our all of us do this job for public safety and and. Everything, everyone followed the law, the, uh, the prison, the parole board, the police, we did everything, everyone did everything we could, and he served his maximum sentence, he still got out and re -offend. and like I said, I think maybe it would be a good time to revisit uh, some of these situations, to, sorry to prevent it, and, and, but, you know, the law is what it is right now, and we follow the law as it is. So you're saying in part this is a failure of the system? Well, I don't think it's a failure of the system, because the system is, what I'm saying is, I think, this is a good opportunity for us to engage maybe with the legislature on changing it for the future. And, and you know, it's no, I've been there long enough in the DA's office that I've seen a change in the way that the system generally deals with sexual abuse and child abuse in particular, takes it much more seriously now. Um, I'm not sure that, that the individual would have, in fact, I'm, I would say that, that he would have not gotten the sentence uh, that he that he did back then, he got five to twenty, but he served twenty. So um, it is taken much more seriously in general now. Uh, but I still think, just if you're asking me, I don't think ten to twenty years is enough. Ma that's the maximum we can give for somebody for kidnapping um, a, a child, and and I don't personally think that that's enough. And, and I don't think that provides protection to the public. We see these sexual offenders, these sexual predators. There, are so many of them are simply wired differently. It's not about um, necessarily about rehabilitation. It's about protection. And and you know, I'm not talking again. I'm talking generally. I'm not talking about this individual in this particular case. But we see it time and time again. And and some of them will flat out tell you that they struggle with it. They know it's wrong, and they can't stop it. And, and uh, that's a problem for our, whole, for our whole society and for our legislature, and I think, I think this is a good case to engage in. I mean, uh, whether you talk about life in prison, whether you talk about the death penalty, I mean, you tell me what, what's the appropriate penalty for someone that kidnaps your child, and that's the way that, and sexually molests your child. Is 10 to 20 years enough? Is 20 to 40 years enough? I submit to you that there's nothing that penalty that, that's gonna be enough to make up for it. But that's not for me to decide. Um, I'm a prosecutor, I follow the laws of the legislature, but that doesn't mean I have to say that, uh, that I necessarily think that, that it's enough punishment. But right now, we, uh, he's not even convicted. This particular case, we gotta convict him, then we'll deal with the sentence um, down the line. I mean, again, that's, that's maybe a de another broader discussion that, that can be had another day. Were they caught on camera anywhere, and um, like at find you? Did we see him going in, or did they have the cameras anywhere? Uh, there's nothing in the affidavit that I recall. Obviously, it's something we're still looking at. I mean, if we can get that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, uh, I know the police have looked at all those at all those avenues, and and depending on you know some of our cases, we do we are able to keep them on, catch them on camera. It makes a huge difference, um, and that's why it's so fortunate that we have our our you know team major witness uh, right there from the beginning. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.